Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream on my channel. Today we will be discussing Dynex, a cryptocurrency I've covered on my channel. And we basically have an expert in here today to discuss Dynex in more depth. I understand it's quite a complex project. The barrier to entry to understanding the project is much higher, but hopefully today we break it down to understand it for everyone. So we got Yeti in here today. Hopefully I didn't mispronounce your name there. I'm taking it as an E. Why don't you yep. introduce yourself and talk about your role in Dynex and then we can get straight into this. Sure. Um, so I, I don't technically work for Dynex. I'm an independent, um, shall we say, auditor for them. Um, I'm there to keep them honest and to be the sort of person that, that you know, can break it down to a more easier, understandable you know, system for people to understand. The the biggest thing for uh, a lot of people is is all the buzzwords, right? That it's very hard to understand. So I try and do my best to break it down. Brilliant. Amazing. So when I contacted the Dynex team initially, they referred me to you to be the person who does all the AMAs and interviews for them. So let's make this clear. He's not a member of the Dynex team, but in a way, He's the guy that the Dynex team refers to to do all these interviews and to talk publicly about the project. And you have, in fact, met the Dynex team? Yeah, I, I actually recently came back a couple of weeks ago from Austria, uh, managed to meet the the main core of the team and a few other people as well while I was out there. It's a really good experience. And how would you say they were in your perspective? Um, I, I'm I'm pretty good at judging people before I've met them, like... Um, they were pretty much as I expected, just very, very um, focused on, on, you know, bringing what they put in their white paper to, to reality, really. They were really dedicated. Brilliant. And one final question before we get into this. Are you paid by the Dynex team? No, no. I will obviously full transparency. Um, recently, they were nice enough to fly me and my wife out to Austria um, to meet them. They paid for the flights and the hotel. Other than that, I paid for everything else myself. Brilliant. Okay, let's get straight into this. Honest, intellectual right here to discuss the project in much more depth. So I think the first question to really ask is, can you provide a simple overview on Dynex? Sure. Um, the, the, the easiest description would be a decentralized supercomputer. Um, so for those people who don't know what a supercomputer is, just think of a lot of PCs all working together as one ginormous PC. Well, now Dynex has effectively took that to one next step, being that instead of all of those machines being in one location in a facility, they're, they're located all over the world. Brilliant. So in a way, <laughs> the power of Dynex comes from the number of people in the network. Correct. Correct. Brilliant. So Dynex is the world's first neuromorphic supercomputing blockchain. We hear those terms a lot, neuromorphic, supercomputing. What does this specifically mean? Okay, so neuromorphic is probably where we should start, right? That's probably the big buzzword that people don't quite understand. So um, there's, there's a couple of types of different supercomputers or quantum computers, as we're going to get into probably further in this conversation. But um, basically, um, there's a couple of different methodologies for how you would plan out for neuromorphic. And neuromorphic is based on a brain design. So it's it's designed to run in the same methodology as how your brain works, where, you know, you have synapses, they fire, they communicate with another synapse. Similar principle, just you're talking the Dynex neuromorphic chips that they generate on the GPU is what is effectively the synapses of a human brain. So it's uh, it's biology inspired, basically. Interesting. <clears throat> so it's a supercomputer and the way the su supercomputer, let's say, thinks, rather than it being linear, it's more of structured in the mind of a brain. So then Pfizer, kind of like a graph in a way, you could argue. Yeah. I mean, think of it this way, that um, a normal computer does ones and zeros, right? 
Mm-hmm. So it does one one that way, one the other way, one that way, one the other way, right? Traditional computers, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. This happens many million times, you know, a second. And and that's how you obviously generate your um, your profile for your, how your clocks are running. Um, with obviously supercomputers and quantum computers and neuromorphic systems, that all happens all simultaneously but also it can be one and zero at the same time. So it gets, so you've got one, zero and one and zero. It's, it gets a little complicated, but to break it down, it's just effectively the next evolution of a PC. We, we, before we see it as a consumer, it's going to be a while before we actually see that as proper consumer products, but it's the, effectively the next, or what we hope will be the next step for a computer. Now, not to jump on the questions here, but that reminds me of quantum computing. A zero and a one together, a qubit. So why do we touch upon that now? How does Dynex differ to quantum computing? Okay. We had this little discussion just before we came on about this exact topic. And the, the best way to describe it is if we've got your traditional supercomputer at one end of the scale and a full-blown consumer-based quantum computer, which we haven't even figured out yet, but that being the other end of the scale. Dynex's uh, neuromorphic system sits somewhere in between right now. It's got enough, it's got enough power um, to be able to actually run against some of the world's leading and probably beat them, um, you know, quantum computers right now. But it's not quantum per se because it's still running on traditional hardware. So it's it's somewhere in between. Interesting. So would you say if we view quantum computing simply as a metric of power, for example, we put a computer or a desktop computer, we put a quantum computer and we put like a smartphone and we rank them based on power and we do that for quantum computing. And then we kind of parallel that to Dynex due to the one, the Dynex neuromorphic algorithm, the way it processes itself. As we talked about the structure of the brain, therefore it's very fast and efficient. And the sheer number of computers on the platform, if we looked at Dynex as a power unit, that would be greater than quantum computing. Is that kind of what- Right now I would suspect so, yes. Um, And that's because of the physical limitation of a quantum computer at the moment. Um, They're massive in scale. Uh, Mm -hmm. They have to be literally frozen in order to work efficiently. Um, and they just haven't produced enough qubits yet to be able to do those high level, super, super hard data sets yet. It's coming. Um, but the benefit of what Dynex is doing is they're harnessing so much more hardware than than one quantum computer has right now. And therefore, you know, the, the speeds and the numbers that they've been showing recently are off the scale compared to traditional quantum computing at the moment, which is impressive to say the least. Brilliant. So let's move on to what the Dynex solve chip algorithm is and how does it differ from traditional proof of work or proof of stake algorithms? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I think probably the best logical way to, to explain this is the Dynex's system is, is a, what they call an entwined blockchain. So and this is going to get even tighter over the next few weeks, maybe a month's time. Um, and I'll get that to that in a second. But basically, the proof of work and the proof of useful work side, or shall we say proof of compute, because it's more the correct v- verb for it, to be fair. Um, the proof of work and the proof of compute are entwined in such a way that both happen at the same time. So it's it's 5% of your capacity of G- your GPU is being consumed for proof of work. 95% of the rest of the card is consumed for proof of useful work or the proof of compute. Um, and so the way it differs is that every other system we've looked at that's proof of work, they, they stop you working on the proof of work side, move you over to the proof of useful work, And then when you finish that, you go back to mining effectively proof of work. Um, That's not the case for Dynex. It it happens both at the same time. Interesting. So that would be the advantage of a typical 
proof of work cryptos. It's simultaneous with the proof of work and proof of compute. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's pretty impressive how they've got it working because a lot of a lot of blockchain companies turned around at the beginning when they started looking at similar similar things and said it wasn't possible. It was too much of an impact on their entire network. Well, Dynex is proving that it can be done if you build the infrastructure out right at the very beginning. And that's the that's the advantage. They built that in mind the moment they built their blockchain. Okay. Okay. So one thing that I'm very curious about, and I know a lot of people are very curious about, is the stats of Dynex. Because when you go on the website, you see 274 million chips running the Dynex solve chip, chip algorithm, 640,000 GPUs being utilized. So what does this actually mean if we kind of think about it in manifesting in reality okay um so i mean the chip number is is a little arbitrary if you think about it right because chip numbers are generated based on a gpu profile so um you know take for example a 4090 is going to generate infinitely more chips than say a 6600 xt will or or a, or a 3060, for example, right? They're, the difference is quite big. So the number of chips is, is very strange because they can pull all of the chips off of one GPU or a very small portion of the chips off of one GPU. So your GPU might actually be doing five jobs simultaneously while also doing their proof of work side for their blockchain. So it's, it's kind of unique in that way. And it's why you'll see the... Job 3042, the SAT solving job, the, the number of chips goes up and down like this, right? And that's because as they need to, they can pull off of that long-term job um, and pull them onto proof of, of compute, and then they push them back afterwards. So it's very unique in the way that it can just go, oh, I need this resource, right? I'll take that resource. Oh, well, actually, I could do with a bit more resources, so it takes a bit more. And then if it runs out of the pool of, of free chips, it'll pull from long-term jobs onto that short-term job and then push them back on. So it's quite adaptive in that method, which is pretty impressive. But the, the bit that's a shock, right, is that what they're already doing with such a little amount of GPUs. Now imagine if we had the amount of GPUs on when back in the Ethereum days, there was, what, two and a half million GPUs or something. So, you know, they're, they're getting there with the amount of GPUs they've got. But could they do with more compute? Of course they could. The more they get, the more compute they can, they can effectively run. So it's a, it's a you know, self-perpetuating cycle, effectively. GPUs need to be on the system for them to then have more compute. So the customer uses it. That then in turn feeds the revenue back to the miners for doing it which in turn is going to get them to turn on more. So it's, it, you know, but where where they're going to end up is anyone's guess at the moment. The, the hash rate on their network just keeps going up and up and up. Interesting there. So, for example, let me take Ethereum. Ethereum yeah. had GPUs on their system, yeah. but that was for Ethereum's processes, web the applications, a whole infrastructure. Correct. So the GPUs on Dynex, what is the end goal? Who's going to be utilizing Dynex? Is it for AI? Is it for Metaverse? What's going to be the specific use cases of Dynex? So you've got, obviously, AI is, is one big potential revenue stream for them, right? People building uh, heuristic networks and, and, you know, algorithms for predictive software, uh, medical scanning, um you know they've they've even looked at financing stuff so like uh could you predict a, a model for a company so you put all their book work into it it takes all of that data set and can predict your your income forecast based on your last five years of growth for example they could absolutely forecast it quite respectably um, my auditing software, for example, the learning data, cent uh, data set that's on there, um, that's basically teaching it how to understand malicious code, uh, viruses, malware, and so forth. Um, that actually is learning using the, the Dynex network right now. It, I'm using utilizing the power of that to train 
a data, you know, a full blown AI system effectively, which is pretty cool, but it's a it's a steep learning curve. So, but there's the the biggest I think the biggest focus for them right now will be SMEs, small and medium enterprise businesses, um, you know, that kind of thing. Smaller businesses to start with, with the idea of once you've got the smaller customers there that are, you know, able to talk about it and talk to bigger customers. And hopefully the the idea is that the, the word spreads a bit. Okay. So can you currently build on Dynax? Talk to us on the use cases, but let's say I'm currently a person who wants to build some form of AI system on Dynax. Yeah. Could I currently build on it? Yeah. Absolutely, you could. Um, right now, it's in a beta phase, um, so you have to apply for their beta access um, or drop into their Discord and, and reach out to the team. Um, but you can absolutely download the Dynex uh, SDKs using Python. So I believe it's pip install Dynex, um, and that will download everything you need. You grab your API keys off them, and away you go, basically. Um, at the moment, the beta the beta phase doesn't have the rewards and the fees tied up yet because they're still working out all of the the nuances around how they're going to bill for it. Um, but effectively, once that's done, it'll be one unified ease of use program. You just bolt it into Python, write your code, and away you go. Would you say that contributes to Dynex's popularity in a way, the fact that it's all through Python, it's not through Solidity or other... Um, which may draw I mean, attention. that's a good question. I think, I think the the logical approach was Python because it's an easy one for most people to pick up, right? Um, but in theory, if you wanted to, there's nothing stopping you porting that across to something like Node.js um, and and having it as an app, um, so that you could run it standalone on a server. I mean, the Python code could also run standalone on a server, so. I mean, opening it up to different avenues of, of options is, I think, where they're going to be going next is once they've got their Python packages, then probably there'll be NPM packages for the, for Node.js, uh, maybe a Visual Studio package uh, for, you know, C Sharp and, and C and stuff like that. So I can see it coming along quite nicely. So what factors do you believe contributed to Dynex's current success? For example, some uh, of the incentivization mechanisms why should someone choose dynex over opposing a project i mean that's a really good question right because if you look in their white paper their emission curve right for their for their mining rewards is actually quite like aggressive i've even i even spoke to dynex myself about this like the 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 curve is is very aggressive but what i do believe is the reason for that is because they wanted some way to keep themselves under a certain amount of pressure to get this done because once the mining rewards dry up, the only thing that's going to keep people mining Dynex is the rewards from the pr proof of compute side. So they have to make sure that their network is running, prepared, got customers on it before that emission schedule finishes. So it'll be interesting to see, does it put a bit of a risk? Absolutely. But it also could be the biggest reward for them. And I think recently or the last four or five months, right, where they've really been pumping out the updates, pumping out the stats, testing, um, you know, testing against other systems as well and, and releasing their findings, good or bad, um, I think has just gone to show the community, I think, a little bit more about what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve. And then obviously there's been videos recently, like I've done as well, where I'm explaining the the platform as a whole and and stuff like that so it's it's made it a little bit easier to understand for you know normal people um not just like nerds like myself for example but actual you know people that just want to see what it's about um i think that has led to a big adoption phase and then obviously the price appreciation and it's sitting around about the dollar mark right now i believe um, you know, it's been pretty consistent for miners as well. And miners love consistency. It's why we were all mining ETH back in the day, because it was consistent payouts. So when will the last Dynex be mined? Uh, I think it's another 
three and a half, four years, something like that. So, but the rewards by then will be tiny in comparison, right? So the question is, how do you keep the miners on the network to give you the, the raw uh, compute power that you need? But you need to make sure they're getting paid, right? So if there's the no mining rewards, how do, you, how do you then pay it? I suppose that's probably leads on to your next question about the marketplace and uh and whether or not you know there's going to be a mechanism for people to earn money absolutely because at the end of the day mining can be lucrative but miners will flock over to the platform which provides them the most revenue so once the last dynex is mined oh, not even then but how would you suggest dynex to generate revenue now i know they have the marketplace coming very very soon can we talk about the marketplace in more depth and just in general how dynex aim to bring on institutions to use their platform that's that's a really good question um so <clears throat> dynex has been slowly hiring up um new staff members to act as uh, ambassadors um affiliates and stuff like that all around the world right so um recently i realized that dynex has quite a a, a large uh, Asian and Chinese market that they seem to have acquired, right? Um, so now they've actually got an affiliate that's working in China to actually go find them uh, customers, universities, medical, that kind of thing. And they're going to work by which, you know, the affiliate does most of the legwork in that area. And then when it's time to get the customer on board and sign the contracts and yeah, I think that's probably the way they'll go. So is Dynex only do that in Asia at the moment? Or are they also doing that in the United States and the UK? Um, I believe that I, I know of two people that uh, Dynex are going to be interviewing in the States for that side of the equation. Um, there's, a, I believe, a couple of uh, s sort of uh, spots open for Europe as well. They're going to try and have quite a global coverage. I think it's quite a sensible bet from them personally just to go for, you know, ultimate coverage and then have a core team finalizing deals off with the big customers and are those people looking for the people who want to adopt dynex or are they actually bringing them on right now and adopting dynex uh, a bit of both at the moment they're they're in the process of adopting a couple of universities at the moment i know that for sure um that's going to take time though those sort of deals are not done overnight mm. right um i can understand this when i signed my first big contract it took me nearly eight months to get everyone in the company to sign off on it because it's not just usually one person there might be 10 people that have got to sign off on that before it can you know become an actual thing but once they get all that paperwork and all the the policies and stuff sorted out right um those kind of places will benefit massively from from dynex right because um colleges universities they all pay to use those kind of services right and they end up paying huge amounts of money well what if they could take a fraction of that money pay dynex give everyone on their course access to use it for as much as they need to so it's not like they're getting a booked time on a supercomputer, but they only get 30 minutes on it because that's all that the uni can afford. They could afford maybe an entire day or a week on it for the similar sort of money. So, I mean, I can see it being quite a disruptive mechanism to the, to the norm, shall we say, of mm -hmm. how companies and, and institutes use it. But I think once they get the realisation of just how much they can compute in a short amount of time, they're going to be blown away by it and and realize what what i realized very quickly is that the the potential for it is massive it's just endless options available hmm so if we're talking about the adoption by universities and institutions in general in the web 2 space will there be any regulation issues because even though dynex is cheaper it is crypto so can we talk about that yeah, that's something that actually when I was over there, I sat down with the team and actually spoke to them about, right? That's something that I was actually a little worried about because, 
European law is very different to American law, for example, and that again is very different to the Asian laws around that, that market. So each individual area is going to be a unique challenge for them, shall we say? I, I think that's the easiest way to describe it. Now, um, they're obviously going to be compliant with all the laws that they they have to be, because um, otherwise they won't be able to trade in that that region. So. I mean, I know that they're working hard to make sure that their their base of operations in Austria, um, that they're all above board on that sort of side. So that covers Europe and the UK. Um, they're working at the moment with someone to figure out all the legalities in America, because at the moment, the legalities around AI are changing rapidly over there at the moment. They've had big meeting, big meetings, excuse me, um, big meetings you know, about AI, you saw recently Elon Musk was there, you know, you know, um, guy Zuckerberg from Facebook, they were all there, right? Google's were there. So they've got to have the right people in, in place at the moment to give them the feedback, which is, you know, what they're working with at the moment. So they're, they're definitely going to be compliant. It's just how many changes are they going to have to make because of the fact that they are tied to crypto even though the crypto is a separate thing right it's the blockchain technology that that they're they're more interested in the crypto side of it is more a secondary part to the system right it's mm. what what they're going to use to pay their miners for their work but fundamentally it's the blockchain and their technology that's that's first and foremost for them yeah great answer there and that kind of brings me on to what prompted dynex to <laughs> essentially be on chain because ah. this same structure could work web two but they decided to make it web three so can we talk about that yeah actually i can i can go one better and, and i brought home a piece of i brought home a piece of history from dynex while i was over there right so this is the the prototype for the dynex um you know neuromorphic chip so it's 12 fpgas six and then six right what they found was this wasn't even close to being efficient. It just draws too much power. It doesn't calculate nearly as accurate as a, as a GPU can. And so what they realized quickly was this is a massive investment, right? If you're going to do it like this, you're talking multi-millions of dollars worth of investment, right? Whereas if they harness blockchain and get it right, the overheads are actually very small. So... I see why they looked into it um, and I see why they switched over to it. The, you know, especially when you think of the, you know, if they were to have to buy enough FPGAs to cover what they've got on network now, it would be $5 million minimum. And that's not even including the infrastructure you're going to need around it. The power, the internet, all the management, all the maintenance of it you know, fire suppression, building security, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So actually, by harnessing blockchain, they actually sort of almost stumbled upon the perfect solution for what they were planning on doing. Interesting. So in a way, they realized that it would be more beneficial to utilize GPUs rather yeah. than that mechanism. Then Absolutely. they thought, okay, well, what's the best way to harness GPUs? Well, we could buy a whole factory of GPUs. But is that really the most efficient way to do it, especially if the power of Dynex comes to the number of GPUs on the platform to provide the most computing power and run the Dynex solve chip algorithm? So I guess that led them on to, okay, well, what's the best way to do that? I guess blockchain technology, because people around the world can essentially utilize their mine and utilize their GPU and then provide all the computing power. So yep. yeah, in a way, it's if you think about it, it is a simple answer why they would go over to use the blockchain. It's Again, almost a perfect storm for them, right? Because they needed they needed a service where which would be infinitely scalable. Well, if you're buying hardware, it's not infinitely scalable because a you've got money to take into effect mm -hmm. and space, because you can only hold so many GPUs in a building before you're going. Now I need another building, mm. and suddenly you know those outlays are going up and up and up um, every single time. Whereas actually, the way they're doing it with blockchain. The overhead stays the same because you need more GPUs. Okay, somebody brings on more GPUs. Suddenly you've got that now more compute available to you. 
with no extra cost. Yeah, and also safety concerns, because the more GPUs you add into a factory, I'm sure the, the safety criteria, you know, increases, you know, simple fire, oh God, could, yeah, absolutely. Simple fire could be your whole business out of operation. Yeah. And it's very true what you said about the infinitely scalable aspect to it, because there's always going to be sort of a GPU, because GPUs around the world. And if someone yep. wants to earn money from providing a GPU, then they can do so. So in a way, it saves Dynex from spending a lot of money trying to buy loads of GPUs when people can provide the GPU. And based on the amount of money that Dynex generate, then they'll get you know aspects of that G of that revenue. So in a way, it's creating a business model where they don't have to spend any money. So exactly, it's a genius exactly. idea. It's it's a it's a win win for everyone, right? Because like I say, the cost overhead from the company's perspective just so much cheaper to do it that way than buying up your own hardware, the staff costs, the electric. Mm -hmm. There's just so many extra things to think about. And I just think the perfect solution is that, you know, is that what they've done is is pull the pull the blockchain together and, and entwine it with their proof of compute. Now that's the bit that's super impressive is that they managed to actually entwine it. So brilliant. So the next question I have is in regards to more of the token side. Is the Dynex or DNX token fair launched? Yes. Yeah, there was no pre-mine. Um, I believe even the team, when they need extra Dynex to pay a bounty or they want to pay for a block of work from another coder or they, they want to do something with the Dynex um, token, then they go and buy it directly from an exchange at the current rate. If that's high, that's high. If it's low, it's low. Um, but they buy it as and when needed. They don't have like a foundation pot, although that might come down in the future. Who knows? Not sure yet. Um, but right now, there is no uh, foundation pot. There's no there's no pot of money, as it were. They go and buy it as and needed. And is the supply locked? Can they increase the supply? Can they mint more tokens? Or is it the same Technically, amount? they could. It would require a hard fork on their network. Um, do I think they're going to do it? No. Um, originally, there was up for 100 million tokens, I believe. They've, that's now 110. And that was because right at the very beginning, they had some uh, network problems and a network hack right at the very early stages or some something went catastrophically wrong. So they had increased it by an extra 10 mil to be able to facilitate everyone getting their funds back um because they felt very upset that, that it happened and they wanted to make things right so the answer is yes they could increase it will they i don't really see it i don't see the benefit of increasing it because all you're going to do is dilute the pot um obviously the more customers who are on ramping and then having their fiat changed to dynex to do their compute side is obviously going to help keep the liquidity being used on exchanges effectively. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I suppose the goal would be to use the token to pay out to the miners in enough time to get the platform generating revenue to then pay out to the miners. Correct. That'd be the goal of a platform Correct. like Dynex. Correct. And that's where the marketplace comes in because that's, that's the fear on ramp but it's also your on-ramp to get your API keys. It's your on-ramp to see all your usage statistics um, and obviously being able to, what well, as they put it, hire a coder. Um, that's something else that they're, they're going to introduce um, in their marketplace. Now, I'm okay to say this because the, you know um, they don't mind me talking about this, but basically um, inside of there, as a coder, so for myself, I'm a coder, right? Um, I could go in there and post up that I'm looking for work and people could or companies could say, I need this code, I need it by this date and this is how much Dynex I'm willing to pay for it. And then effectively as a coder, I will be earning Dynex for producing code for customers. Um, and again, it allows people to earn a little bit of extra revenue, almost like an internal bounty program per se. Hmm, that, that's quite interesting. But what, what would happen at one point? Let's say Dynex is mined 
and we no longer could pay out in Dynex, would we then switch over to a, a different model to pay in, I don't know, fiat or USD? Maybe. Um, there may be an option to actually have it off-ramp in fiat as well um, as Dynex. They're, they're still, I believe, up in discussion of how they're going to do their off-ramp side of things. I know they obviously are going to include Dynex as an off-ramp. That makes logical sense. They've already got the network. Um, but an off-ramp for fiat would make a lot of sense so that then you've got a two-way street, fiat on and off and Dynex on and off. Um, I think that's logical. That makes a lot of sense. Especially in regards to the sustainability of Dynex because uh, at one point there is going to be fluctuation in price of DNX. So if someone wants it at market price, same price, then the best thing would be to do is do stables or, or fiat. So that would be a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the next question, which is a very important question, it's probably the question you get the most out of any question you probably get, and it's in regards to the team and whether or not the team are going to be doxxed or if they have plans to, do, to be doxxed. Okay, so this was one of the reasons why I flew out there, right? Because people kept saying that they're, not, they're unwilling to, to be in the public face, uh, you know, facing and stuff like that at the moment. Um, it comes down to a lot of legal stuff, right? They are a company first and foremost using a blockchain, um, not a crypto company with a blockchain. Um, so the the rules around what they're doing is slightly different, right? So they've got intellectual property that they're currently locking in. For that, they need to make sure it's all above board and nothing can stop that. So I get why they're not coming out yet, but they have said that they will be public facing at some point. That is the plan. It is the overall end goal. Um, how many of them will come out and put their face out there? I don't know yet. Um, it's obviously down to the individual as well as the company because the company can say, oh, we want to, you know, put out there who we are. It's still down to the individual to say yes or no. So if somebody doesn't feel comfortable, I can, you know, I can completely understand that. Yeah, that's understandable. Now, I did see a, an interview, I think, with one of the Dynex team members, and they did say once illegal structures are in play, and I think that's what you're referencing there, then they will be doxxed to, to, some, to some extent, which is good. Yeah. So, to, in your opinion, what would you say, uh, how big of an issue would it be if they didn't dox themselves publicly? Um, in your me personally, I'm not too bothered. I let the tech do, I let the tech do the talking, right? um the project's now a year old if they were going to rug pull it it would have been in the first couple of months when it went like that straight away because the bigger gains would have been in that gap right because you would have got it at really ridiculously low prices even if it went up by a fraction of a penny suddenly you're at two three hundred x right whereas now the the profit margin is you know you might only get a 2x return if you put in a little bit wait for a little bit of a pump and get back out again so if they were going to pull it they would have done it earlier than this right for sure um also um with them now being a year old right it starts giving maturity to the platform maturity of the platform is similar to ethereum similar to bitcoin similar to any of the the big layer ones right when they started getting uh into their sort of second year third year the technology is more mature people understand the technology more people um you know trust the technology more and that's where dynex is now people are starting to trust the technology because they can see it starting to work and i, I, I i'm enjoying watching this bit because this is like back when bitcoin started right i watched it with with you know all my friends, I got into Bitcoin super early. You know, my house is effectively paid for by my profits of Bitcoin. Best, th best thing I ever chose to do. Honestly, best thing I ever chose to do. But it reminds me a lot of that where I'm seeing the adoption and then more adoption. And then suddenly people are starting to believe the technology is there. It works. They can see it working. The next step will be once customers get on there and they start all talking about it. And again, it's a bit that that snowball effect. One will lead on to another, which will lead on to another. So I'm I'm looking forward to where it goes next. Absolutely, and we do have in the roadmap blue chip testimonials. They are looking to uh, adopt people onto their platform per se. And yep. one thing, and the final thing I do want to say, 
is in regards to the barrier to entry. Because one thing I found very unique about Dynex was the system requirements. This is kind yeah. of like the main idea. You can turn anything into supercomputer, supercomputer essentially, because the system requirements are much lower than the competitors. Can we talk about that real quick? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's one of the questions I get asked loads. So I can, under, I can understand and I can explain this quite easily, right? So a lot of traditional... Uh, proof of useful work concepts. So that's like your vast, your claw, your fluxes, um, octospace, all of those kind of ones, right? GP Utopia, for example, they're all proof of useful work concepts, right? Um, they all require as much bandwidth as possible. Why? Because they, lar they large load the data sets into your GPUs, right? So the more bandwidth it's got, so if it's got X16, it's going to be a lot quicker over that to load up your card than say over 1x speed, like what most miners are used to, 1x speed connections, right? Well, Dynex found a way by utilizing these chips, they only actually have to load up very, very small chunks of data, right? Because you imagine if you've got 200 chips per GPU and I'm sending 100 meg data, to all of these chips, I only actually have to send a very small part of the whole to each chip, right? So therefore, 1x speed is absolutely adequate because the job is no bigger than maybe 20 meg for your cards. And then that gets shunted out to all your chips, reconstituted and then sent back. Again, doesn't need huge, massive bandwidth uh, requirements. So the barrier to entry for Dynex is literally, if you've got a mining rig already, you can just turn it over to Dynex and away you go. And because your wallet is tied to your proof of useful work side, when you're paid for your proof of useful work, it's paid by Dynex, not the pool. So therefore it just goes straight into your wallet. All wow. on chain, you'll be able to see it in the marketplace. You'll also be able to see all your payments. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty impressive how they've got it to work. Yeah. It'd be one of the things that I say again is something that could incentivize the adoption of Dynex because at the end of the day, unless the you have thousands of dollars, the only one doing one X speed proof of use will work. Yeah, exactly. So unless you have thousands of dollars to throw into a, a mining rig, which most people don't, then you're not going to be able to mine. So even if you no. do not care about the vision of Dynex at all, if you're someone who's looking to mine to earn rewards to some extent or earn the revenue generation from Dynex, then you're going to go over to what you can mine. And because Dynex has such a low barrier to entry, it's going to be one of those platforms that people do flock over to utilize. So that's kind of my take on it. And I think it's one of the main selling points behind Dynex personally. So that is all the main questions I have to ask. If there's anything that you want to specifically talk about, then we can talk about that. If not, well, I guess probably the logical one would be talking about the marketplace, right? It's the big thing yeah, that correct. everyone wants to know about at the moment. Um, what's going on with it? How's it progressing? Have I seen it? Have I played around on it? Um, the answer is yes to all of the above. I, I've got access to the Dynex marketplace uh, alpha at the moment. Um, I, I actually sent you a screenshot um over discord by the way so if you if you want to pop that up on screen you're more than welcome um this is obviously something that they're working on currently so you'll you'll obviously have to bear with um but yeah basically the the system is a lot further on than i was expecting put it that way um the the team are working hard to make sure that everything is um as it should be shall we say because they're they're very concerned that wow. the marketplace really has to live up to expectations if we if, if if that's to make sense so you know if if you look at it from this perspective right the the marketplace is your on-ramp if that's if that's not up to scratch right and doesn't make it easy for the customer whoever that might be whether that be a big institute a big company a small time person or just somebody like a dev having to play around if that on-ramp isn't easy enough to use then you're you're really in a bad way 
because you're now in a process of where you know nothing you want to attempt can be done because nobody can you know figure it out how to use it so this is a screenshot of obviously their marketplace currently um as it currently stands right now um <laughs> you can even see my dynex balance as well but <laughs> matter um but this is this is the start of it right will there be more available to it yes um will there be more available stats yes it's just that they're bringing them on slowly but they've got somewhere in the region of about 40 variables right now that they're capturing which is super impressive that they're already capturing it um and then on the you can see it on the left hand side right you've got compute on dynex and earn with dynex so the compute on dynex right is basically a how-to guide and where you go to see any jobs that are currently running um you can go into the code library and be able to grab a code piece of code grab it to your account tweak it run it straight on the network um and then earn with dynex is the bit that we were just talking about where coders like myself can put up their own code and say i want 50 dynex per person that downloads it and you hit download it deducts it straight from your balance and then that is then unlocked to your account it's pretty cool um and yeah so i believe there's going to be another area as well so you've got usage but there also be something for dynex uh experts as they, they're designating them where you'll be able to see the usage statistics of your code so that's like you know how many downloads how much money you've made what's owed that kind of thing so yeah all around that looks pretty good looks pretty clean nice graphical user interface for adoption i, yeah. I see no issues of mine doesn't look too complicated simple tabs earn a dynex go over then you can see everything so yeah, nicely to show so we can get a, a brief understanding of how it's going to look in the end. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't mind me showing off things as long as there's not, you know, how the secret source is done. They don't they don't really mind. They actually quite like the fact that I'm willing to talk about it very openly. Good on good and bad side. Right. So like I say, if they don't get that marketplace nailed. Right. And it work how they expect it to work then the on-ramp isn't going to be easy. If the on-ramp isn't easy, then nobody's going to on, on-ramp into using the system. And then you've got the same in return on the off-ramp as well, right? What happens if, um, say, for example, <laughs> you just brought that up. That's actually the other account. Um, so that's the main account that is currently running all of their cloud service. So you can see the different metrics all being shown up properly. Um, it's quite a lot of metrics. Right. So, but yeah, it's they're, they're really cracking on with it. And that's that's super, super important for them. The on and off ramps have to be there. They have to work. They have to be easy to use. That's what they're focusing on now um, is their on and off ramps. Amazing. Everything looks nice on my end. So brilliant. So thank you very much for coming here today. It's I right. appreciate you taking time of your day to talk about Took a little bit of time to get us all hooked up because obviously I shot over to Austria, but yeah, you know, it's been good. It, it's been good. I think we've learned a lot about Dynex. A lot of the buzzwords we once knew as buzzwords and our simple terms that we can understand ourselves. So it, it's, it's really been great. So thank you very much for coming here today. Thank no you problem. guys for watching this live stream. Check out the links down below guys to the Dynex team. I'll also put some links to check out Yeti, his Discord, or anything else he wants to share. Maybe his, you know, website that I see he has on his Discord page. So we'll post all of that in the links as well for you guys to check out. So thank you very much, guys, for watching us today. I appreciate you for coming here today as well. So we'll end it here, guys. Goodbye, everyone.